they needed a bass player. So I, he said, can you do that? I'll do it. When you're offered an opportunity, take it. There are very few and far between in the music business. When in the paper, for a talent contest, I think it, it's called the Palomino Club in North Hollywood. So we won $50. It was like winning the lottery. <laughs> we were playing at, in Rome, New York. Mickey Gilly was playing at the Boonville Fair. After the fair, he and his band came to hear our band, the Moss Bank Mule Band, where we were playing. Because of that, he decided to bring us. He, Gilly's Club is, or was, before it mysteriously burned down, <laughs> the largest nightclub <coughs> in the world. And he had just built a recording studio attached to it. We found out in New York, if you were in a hat, when you go inside, you can take your hat off. In Texas, get out of the car, walk up to the door, put your cowboy hat on, <laughs> walk into the club, and there are people, and I saw that same fluidity doing the Texas two-step around that huge dance. While I was there, I made friends with the fiddle player in the house band, write letters to each other. You know, on paper. <laughs> put them in a pipe. Put them in a bowl and stay. There was no internet. Robert actually called me one day. Said Gilly's is looking for a new fiddle player. So I called Gilly. I said, Gilly, I'm your man. He said. We're leaving in three days. Can you be here in three days? I said, sure. So I got on the phone and I thought, how am I going to get out of there in three days? <laughs> when you're offered an opportunity, take it, because you don't know. Mickey Gilly wasn't the one I was thinking of. But that was the opportunity that presented itself. So I took it. Packed up everything I could in my little Dodge Colt. Found out that I had the only vehicle in the state of Texas that did not have air conditioning. <laughs> Even old pickup trucks had air conditioning. I didn't have it. But told me two things. I had in New York, we wore t-shirts and blue jeans. So I figured if I'm playing for a country star, I'm going to have to wear nice western shirts and maybe press jeans. So Gilly told me two things. What goes on on the road stays on the road. I thought, it's, you know, it's your business, you know, you do what you want. And he said, he pointed to a co rack and said, the old fiddle player was bigger than you, so you're going to have to get your suits altered before you go off on the road, he points to a coat rack. There was a red one, a blue one, and a yellow one. Well, like that. Okay. I would put on the suit about one minute before the show, and the second the show was over, <laughs> I didn't like this. <laughs> it was called Irving Cowboy. And it was about Gillies. And that's when we decided to make the movie. So I was in the right place at the right time. What we're going to play is the song that I won the Grammy Award for. Orange Blossom Special. Every fiddle player in the world plays it. I happen to be there. Like I said, at the right time, right place at the right time. Before we started to record it, Patsy Swayze choreographed the movie. 
before we started recording the song, like she walked in, into the studio. I, I was in a booth, and the rest of the band was in different places in the studio. And said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dance the hoedown that John Travolta is going to dance. And I want you to watch me. Watch me for the speed. I'm going to speed up in the middle. Watch me for that. I'm going to give you a cue for when it ends. And then it has to end right when I tie it. Engineer said, can you play a harmony part to what you just did? I said, sure. So I did that. I played both of the parts on the track, but, they, but since there were two fiddle tracks, they wanted to have two fiddle players in the movie playing. So <laughs> you'll be watching John Travolta dance and Gator Conley. But if you happen to around one minute into it, like I say, in the back left, you may see two fiddle players, but no. If you started to get the feel of it and realized it, it didn't mean anything. So one time when they said take five, John Lee came up to me and said, let's go over to the studio and write a song. I said, John, what if they didn't need us? So we went over to the studio, spent four hours there, and wrote a song, a pretty good song, I thought came back, and they still were ready for it. Then by about an hour later, the director called me today and said, no, that's enough. It took me about three minutes to cut the tracks in the studio. It took four hours to film, to film it. It's nine seconds. Nine seconds of music took four hours. They take the tape measure out to the camera, film one angle, do whatever they do for 20 minutes, come back, another angle, tape measure. They only have one angle on the film, but it that's <laughs> <laughs> four hours.
foot from her, her band. The, these Texans never heard of her. <laughs> I was telling them what a great blues guitar player and singer she is. So the first time they said take five, when Bonnie Ray was up on stage, got her slide up, put on her finger, started playing and singing. The, the rest of the band was going. <laughs> <laughs> so every time they said take five, when Bonnie was there, we jammed uh, until they were ready for us. Working for a country artist every night, they want you to sound like the record, their record. Every night you play, it's stifling musically because you're just putting the same whole apart every single night. So after two years, I moved to Boulder, Colorado. I uh, started a band with my brother. We had two fiddles, no lead guitar. I felt like I was unchained. I, could, I felt so free. But since there was no lead guitar, I had to figure out anything I could do electronically, with effects or improvisation, whatever, to make the violin the lead instrument. We, we played in ski resorts and we played all the way in the Rockies, all the way from Boulder up to Edmonton, Alberta. And at the time, at that time in Edmonton, every any place you went, any club you went into, someone would say, Wayne Gretzky is going to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw him. <laughs> While we're setting up to rehearse one day, Says, you've been nominated for a Grammy. <clears throat> yeah, I said, sure. He said, no, look in the paper right here. So I, call, I called Neris and I said, I'm not in your band anymore. Do I, am I still eligible for, for this Grammy? He said, we don't care who's in the band. We care if you, did you help play on the record. That's what the Grammy's for. Well, I said, yeah. The last time they had it at Radio City Music Hall in New York City, if I were king of the Grammys, it would still be here. But <clears throat> Staples Center, you can sell a lot more tickets. My tickets are not cheap. I didn't really consider whether we had a shot in winning or not. Of course, that year, everybody knew it. All I remember was when they announced the winner, I wasn't sure if they said our name. All I remember was I was sitting in a seat, and the next thing I knew, I was up on stage. <laughs> I don't know how I got there. Uh, the presenters were Jerry Mulligan and Helen O'Connell. <clears throat> One thing I found out. They, they don't know who the winners are until they open the envelope. So on the Grammy, the Grammy they hand you, it's just a plain plastic base <laughs> because they don't know. So as you're walking off stage, they ask for it back. <laughs> I decided that if you're going to do something in, in the music business, you need to be in. L.A., New York, or Nashville. I was going to go to L.A., but I ended up in Nashville. I knew more people in Nashville. You need to be world class. Networking is very important. And you need to be liked, well liked, by everybody. If you're great, because there, there's so many great musicians there. If, if you're not well liked by by producers, well, or you don't get along with the other players, you have to know also where not to play. Very important. 
for live performance also. You never, ever want to get in, get in the way of the artist, of the singer. On stage, in a recording session, don't ever want to get in the way of, of the star. I was doing a session, I think this must have been for the Urban Cowboy movie. I, I was there, I was warming up, tuning up, rosining the ball. While I started doing that, James Byrne walked in, got his guitar out, listened to the song once, they played it back, he played his guitars. It was subtle and it was perfect. Packed up his guitar and he was done. I wasn't even done all that. I was doing one session at RCA Studio B where Elvis recorded. I played one high note kind of a stinger. They were hooting and hollering in the control room. Just one note in the whole song. That's what they wanted. It's not how many notes you play. It's playing the right notes in the right place and knowing where not to play. When I lived in Hendersonville, North Beach, walked in the parking lot, a great keyboard player was there, great drummer lives there, great fiddle player lives there, great steel player lives there, it's kind of hard to work with, so you know hard. <laughs> but if you don't get along with them, when people don't want to work, Daddy West, guitar player, knocked on my door and said, our fiddle player just quit. We're going on the road with Kenny Rogers in a couple of days. You want to go with us? Sure. Can you play rhythm, guitar? So he gave me some albums, some chord charts. No rehearsal. to the arena. I get out, I'll, I see just a bunch of blue seats. Do the show, get back on the bus, go to sleep, wake up in the next arena, get out, look up, looks like the same one, except now all the seats are red. <laughs> 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 
So after the game, after Donnie asked me if I wanted to work for you know, be the regular fiddle player, and I turned it down because I was working. I would, I had a job with a guy, Ken Lavoy. His went by the name Lobo. If you ever heard a song of the song "Me and You" and a dog named Boo, <laughs> that was his big hit. He had enough in Nashville. Wanted to move back to Florida and play golf. Get another knock on my door. I want to go out with Donnie West again. Sure. This time, at the end of the tour, Donnie said, "You want to? Would you like to be in my band?" When you're offered an opportunity in this business, take it, because you don't know when another one is going to come your way. So I did. She was so different from any, any country artist I had ever worked for. She encouraged improvisation. There was one, one fiddle solo. And then one time she said, I'll play it again. So I played it again. Part of the show, after we did your cheating heart, one night she had, she looked at me and said, play, just play something, anything. Okay, so I, I played over the rainbow. Doing the show was the best thing in the world. After the show, getting on the bus, nothing was worse than me. But you learn how to read without getting nauseous. I saw every episode of the Andy Griffith show, show <laughs> five or six times. That's all we had. Players in Nashville, their work class, and they're always trying to get better. No one ever thought they were good enough. Always thought everyone. I thought I was the only person. I thought I was terrible. Always had to get better. Then I found that this the keyboard player who was my roommate with Donnie West, thought he was terrible. Always had to work on getting, getting better. He would set up his keyboard at night. I was getting ready to go to sleep, but he was conscientious. He put headphones on and practiced the keyboard. So I would hear, <laughs> I said, Barry, you're not, you're not helping me. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Grand Ole Opry, we do our show, we do a sound check. Each one of us would spend about 20 minutes getting our sound, getting it right with, with the house, with the monitors. It would take us four hours to do the whole thing. Um, the Grand Ole Opry, there are three artists on on a half hour segment, you have one artist does their segment, there's a commercial, you have 60 seconds to find the nearest amplifier, plug in, and, and be ready to play. But the engineers that are, have been doing, doing it for years, they're excellent. Whenever we did the album, we got to do the TV segment. All the rest were on the radio. If the house band got to do the TV segment, they got the TV pay, which was higher. So I went, went to Weldon Myron, the steel player, and said, you want to play with us? He said, of course. I said, Weldon, we're doing your sheet and harm again. He looked at me and said, they all paid the same. The journey is not over. I'm still, in the last several years, creating these two CDs. I also found out, we used to, we used to joke about phoning in your car. I was offered to play fiddle on a, on a recording for a, a band from Switzerland. They did the tracks there. 
put it in a Dropbox folder. I pulled the tracks out of the Dropbox folder, loaded it into Pro Tools, played my fiddle part, put it back in the Dropbox folder. The journey is not over. Now I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. <laughs> Yeah, we're done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.